Welcome to Liquid Margins. We have some great guests today. We have Katie Cotton. She's a history teacher at St. George's School. We also have Justin Serenzia. He's the director of the Merck Center for Teaching. He's a history teacher and the Dean of Teaching and Learning also at St. George's School. And then our moderator today is Jeremy Dean, the VP of Education at Hypothesis. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy. Actually, wait, sorry, mess that up. <laughs> it's Friday. Um, I would like to give our guests a chance to say something about themselves. Thanks. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Cotton, and I am a history teacher mainly at St. George's, though we just um, became a humanities department, and I've been spearheading our first true humanities class, which is um, Humanities One for our freshmen, which is a place-based class that looks at um, the school's history and um, the history of the island that we're on um, and a few other things. Um, in a in addition to teaching, I'm the curriculum coordinator for the humanities department as well as the director of our summer programs. Um, and I've been using hypothesis primarily in my American studies class. Um, this is going on my fourth year for those of you who are in here earlier. Um, I just said my, my class this morning used hypothesis for the first time this year and I'm very excited about it. Um, Justin and I teach the same American studies course. Um, so he definitely brought me into the fold and I've been a huge hypothesis kind of advocate um, and fanatic since then. So thank you for having me today. Thanks, Katie. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Justin Serenzia, Dean of Teaching and Learning at St. George's School. Um, this is year number eight for me back at the school. Uh, and while I do a lot of administrative stuff these days, I, I find that I, I find my most um, positive experiences working with students in the classroom. So um, came upon Hypothesis about five years ago, it was just as a, a, an act of serendipity in lots of ways, um, and have really started to run with it in really fun and interesting ways as we sort of scratch the surface of digital humanities at St. George's at the secondary level. So excited to be here today and, and to chat with you all. Hi folks, uh, Jeremy Dean, uh, Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. I've been at about at Hypothesis for about five years um, and was at a company called Rap Genius before that for four years. Um, and before that I was a high school English teacher. Um, and I was actually uh, teaching high school English when I first discovered Rap Genius, uh, which is a collaborative annotation platform for song lyrics. Um, students told me about it because I was always talking about annotation in the classroom and they're like, you should end rap music. So they told me to uh, check out Rap Genius um, and I dropped everything I was doing at the time digitally and just said, okay, this semester, just sign up for Rap Genius. <laughs> it was a little of a weird thing to say to, to the kids. Um, and that's what we're going to use as our sort of digital tool. No more Twitter, Facebook, Wiki, uh, whatever else we were using. Um, and so that is how I got into collaborative annotation. And uh, I was offered a job by Rap Genius because uh, the, the folks there were interested in this use case <laughs> of students using their te technology to annotate. Uh, it wasn't just rap lyrics, I was doing it with literature and, and other things, uh, or you know, canonical literature, I'd say. Um, and uh, that's how I got into this game. So I want to. Uh, I want to start off by asking you to elaborate, Justin, on the discovery of hypothesis or your discovery of collaborative annotation technologies and tell me a little bit about the serendipity there and, you know, tell me your sure. story about discovering it. Um, so when I, I, I sort of, I was teaching AP US history around a really standard sort of college board oriented curriculum and then had the opportunity to shift away from that. And that was exciting for a variety of reasons, primarily because of the rich history that our school has on our island, which Katie alluded to moments ago. So I, I started to explore many different textbook options. Um, and again, through just a matter of luck and just a lot of research and probably being on Twitter at the right time, uh, came upon the American Yop, which is a collaboratively built online open source textbook and said, wow, this looks like a great resource to use in my US history class. But I know students are going to bristle against reading an electronic text and not being able to mark it up or to physically hold it in their hands. I just, I, you know, I just was hoping or wishing for some form of annotation. And, and I don't know how I, I don't remember, but I just have came upon hypothesis sort of simultaneously parallel 
to the uh, discovery of the American Yop and, and just ran with it that summer and rolled it out five years ago. Um, and was really, really heartened by the types of learning and what I was seeing in the classroom. So that's the short version of it. Don't worry about being short. We've got plenty of time here. Um, and so one, one question I have as a follow-up to that, Justin, is, you know, you were talking about they normally have a paper book, right? So maybe you were talking about with them, had you talked to them about annotation before this discovery of this tool and, and the need for it in, in this sort of uh, digital environment? I didn't, but it, since this class was primarily for juniors, I sort of made the decision late in the spring to prepare for the next year. And they, they're certainly familiar as 11th graders in high school with the concept of annotation, but only in, in really the physical sense by that point. Um, I think maybe in some instances they had seen some, you know, like a New York Times annotation of an inaugural address or the State of the Union, but they were never able to create the annotations layered on top of a digital text. So that was the one way that I, I felt confident that I'd be able to sell them on this digital text. It also helped that it was a free text and was open resource. Um, I knew that that would be the thing that could give me the inroads to having them commit to the experience. There's a joke amongst high school history teachers that when you give them a reading, you know, the book just simply becomes a doorstop for them and they're not really going to do the reading and maybe you quiz them. And I just wanted to get beyond that. Like quizzing can have real value, but I wanted it to be more organic and I wanted it to feel like the conversation was happening in the text in a way that a discussion board in an LMS typically doesn't recreate. So thinking about use cases in that regard, I started to, you know, just just think about all the possibilities that existed and then committed to it over the summer knowing that it could you know it could fall on its face but luckily had a good group of students in that first year and that sort of sold me on the experience as well and katie before you were introduced to hypothesis was annotation something you talked to uh students about either in an analog or digital context or was it a practice you tried to instill yeah, it definitely was. And I can I can feel myself doing that with my freshman right now whose um, texts are, are analog. They, they do have paper in front of them for the most part right now, though I do plan on introducing hypothesis. So um, I think definitely, I think Justin and I have similar language around how we talk about annotations, whether it's on paper or online about um, having a conversation with the text, talking to the text. Um, things like that. But I think what's great about hypothesis is that that thinking becomes um, public or public to our group. And it's it's you aren't just talking to the text, you're talking to the text and talking to your classmates at the same time. So um, I certainly still teach analog annotation. And I think there is something to be said about doing those basics of how to identify the the key importance of a text that's going to translate from um, pen and paper to to the internet, but I think the um, collaborative and communal component of it is what elevates it because I think otherwise it's just a silo and I would often have kids say, well, I why why do I need to underline or, or write in the margins or ask questions like it's just for me. Can I just do that in my notebook. Um, something like that. And this then speaks to a a larger um, purpose for that, which is um, that that communal. And I have two separate sections of the same class, but I have them all in one hypothesis group together. So I have 25 um, minds on one text at the same time, which is great. That's awesome. Uh, do you guys ever get any pushback around that sort of transition, right, between either from students or from parents, I'd ask, or maybe even from colleagues around that transition from like annotation as a kind of private act that's for the you know, individual versus something uh, shared. I'll just, this is may maybe ancient, you know, history, but uh, I know I look quite young, but when I was teaching 15 years ago in high school, I remember like introducing discussion forums um, and I had to have a meeting with a parent once because I was like, I think I, the assignment was like, you know, share your thesis idea for your paper in the discussion board. Uh, and parent actually called a meeting with me to say, you know, this is Johnny's ideas and his individual work and he shouldn't have to share it with his classmates. Maybe that's again ancient history, but do you ever have pushback against that idea of sort of socializing, making it more public, your, your thinking? Justin, why don't I'll you start? St yeah, I'll, I'll start. I mean, this is, I, I'm generalizing here, but I feel like in terms of generations, they have been more publicly facing 
for more of their lives than we have. And I, I think it also speaks to like, what is the nature of the assignment? If it's just a closed loop between teacher and student, that's one form of writing or one form of learning that they might express. But if we lead with the, the assignment, the activity, the learning being more publicly facing, I think that's one way to get beyond that. And I'll say like, I have experienced some resistance, but I think it's just resistance from not knowing. And the second you start to illuminate and describe possibilities, and, and for, for me, like hypothesis has become a feedback for my own teaching. If I go in and check out the annotations from a text, that can inform what I'm doing in class that day, that week, what didn't land well, and it makes me a more efficient and effective teacher for their learning. Um, so I, when I say that to parents, like that immediately goes, oh, I get this. I mean, I'll be honest, I use hypothesis on the parent, you know, parents' family weekend when they come in, like I will show them some of the hypothesis, some of the annotations that they're um, sons or daughters are making on the text. And it's this moment of like making this really powerful thinking visible that simply doesn't exist in a traditional text. And when you show that back to them, they get really excited. And then they see the conversations that are taking place that then continue into the lunch table beyond the classroom and into the dorm rooms later that night. And it, it sort of becomes not romanticized, but it, it does demonstrate the power and the extension of classroom opportunities that exist through this sort of medium. So I'll kick it to Katie there. Yeah, I would, um, I've never faced any um, pushback from parents. I think, like Justin said, I think when, when parents and, and other colleagues learn about it, they're excited about it. I think from the colleague standpoint, um, I've never had anyone criticize it, but I'd had people not want to get on board with it or be like, Ugh, like that's not something I want to kind of like touch and play with. Um, but since, COVID and how we've all been, how education has just moved to this digital space so quickly. Um, so many of our teachers have hopped on board and I was creating little videos for them last year about signing up for Hypothesis and how to use it and, and showing them um, what my kids were capable of um, with it. So um, so with, parent, with parents and colleagues, it hasn't been pushed back against it, but either an indifference or a, hey, that's cool, I don't know what you're doing over there um, kind of thing. But um, with students, I would say the only time that I've really received pushback is more when a student doesn't feel like they are learning as an individual from annotating on hypothesis. I get sometimes comments that kids are like, it, it makes me stop while I'm reading. And, I, I, it, and it's not so much hypothesis that it is just the, the annotation process in general. I have to stop and I have to break it up and I have to think about it and comment on it. But then I think I, I go to where, where Justin's kind of um, saying, A, that's the whole point. Um, and, and B, I try really hard in my classes to make everything we, we do um, a collaborative experience. We will learn better if we are all learning together. And um, that might be an inconvenience for you, but you also sometimes don't want to talk in class, but you do it because that's benefiting the discussion and conversation there. So um, I tried to move it past the individual's benefit or lack thereof and talk about it in, again, that kind of communal sense. Thanks. Um, I want to sort of start talking a little bit about what kinds of uh, directions and assignments you guys give to students uh, at the secondary level with annotation. But I want to start with something that Justin said um, the difference between writing and assignments that are um, for or inclusive of others, you know, public or social writing assignments versus what you described, uh, Justin, as kind of the closed loop assignment, right? Um, and I, fr frankly, I, I'm, I'm asking for some help for when I talk to folks because almost in every presentation I've given uh, over the past few months as we've onboarded a lot of schools, somebody always inevitably asks me, um, can I make it so that the students' annotations are just visible to me? And so that I would just see Justin's annotations on, say, Love Song of Jail for Proof Rock, and just Katie's annotations on Proof Rock, not in discussion with each other, um, and just Franny's in isolation. That, again, I think that's that closed loop model. Um, and I guess I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts. I, I will sometimes say when people ask me that, I, I will say that sort of seems to me like a, a more of a secondary level uh, pedagogical uh, value or interest, right? Because for example, if I was teaching the Great Gatsby at the secondary level, I probably do need to know, you know, 
what Franny thinks of the green light and how she formulates some thinking about a particular symbol in a class. Um, and, you know, if Nate comes in and kind of hogs the, the space and sort of gives a, the definition or a, you know, full answer, like it makes it harder for others or something like that. Um, it would probably be the reverse as, as Nate is uh, suggesting in the chat that he would, he would be the one at a loss for words and Franny would have taken up the, you know, gotten the answer right. But in any case, um, I don't know, I'm just interested in having you riff on the need for kind of closed loopness uh, in, these, in, in annotation versus the, the messiness and difficulty of open loopness. And this is just something that's a reality. I think, you know, once Franny has an annotation on the green light, it is harder. It is a different thing um, to talk about. <laughs> once somebody has already kind of provided an answer, either you find other real estate to, to find your voice or you have to build on her thinking. And that's a much more higher order uh, activity. But nonetheless, I, I constantly get pushback. People want, I, I want the closed loop version of annotation. Anyway, riff on that. <laughs> Katie, I'd be curious to have you start here, particularly around the YPAR stuff that you did um and just how publicly facing that well like the youth participatory action research with you that you did with your class last year like i have some ideas and and certainly some comments there but i i know you do a better job in american studies at, at often being like very publicly facing in the learning like i think for me when i hear you ask that question jeremy i would ask the educators like what is the purpose of this learning like what are we doing what is the purpose of the social experience in a classroom like why are we gathering together if that's only the case if we're only going to have that closed loopness then we never need to really gather in a social setting either. Like, so I, I'd go to that level, but I'll defer to Katie and then, and then tag in, because um, I think Katie might have some good ideas there. Yeah, so for me, um, it definitely boils down to classroom culture from day one. So I'm on day three right now in class, and um, I can think of every day something I've talked about how like we're not competing with one another, like we're all trying to learn from this. Um, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Like it's really emphasizing those things that I think um, our education system in the broadest of generalizations um, can sometimes hinder in kids that I need to do more and more is better and, and all of those things. So um, for me in that sense that if, if someone got to that annotation about the green light first, then my other students are still learning from that annotation in some way and they might have a different example or instance to reply to that or um, they might be, be able to elaborate or link to something or bring in a piece of art which are all functionalities of hypothesis which are also um, wonderful as well or they might throw in a light bulb gif or something like that which Justin loves to play with gifs and I know he calls them gifs um, and that was our first fight as colleagues um, but um, I do really strive to be very externally focused as a teacher in a, I try not to make things only for my own consumption as an educator. So in American studies, like Justin said, um, we did a whole youth participatory action project a couple of years ago with Newport interviewing different locals, identifying challenges in the community, doing research about those, and then creating some type of resource for the community. Um, one of my final projects for the year is often um, writing a letter to a local business owner or politician about some kind of topic and, and making it a historically informed um, uh, plea to them. So I try to make sure that we know what we can do with the history that we are learning. So um, in a very like circular way, I think that the I see the benefit to the closed loop and I understand that, but I think that can also be accomplished in different ways. Give kids five checkpoint questions um, after they read a homework assignment and ask them what their understanding of a green light is. I don't think that necessarily has to be um, the space that hypothesis takes up in a way. So um, that might be my approach to that. Justin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that last part is precisely where I sort of land on that. Like, I, I think of, for me, hypothesis, and, and Katie used the, the phrase like play and joy. Like, I, I like annotation as being playful and sort of joyful and a sandbox of, of ideas. Uh, I mean, I certainly encourage students to turn off the highlights just to sort of click the little eyeball as they're reading so they're not being influenced and informed by the highlights that they may see from um, their peers before they're reading. You know, if you think about buying a used text and the entire text is highlighted, 
that could inform what your what your eye is drawn to. So that's one part of the closed loop piece. And I think it also just gets back to the the, the social nature of learning. And and also, frankly, being in a US history class or an American studies class, you know, it's not just the one text of Gatsby, right? Like it's this big tent, giant, robust history that we might consider around all different sorts of issues and periods and concepts. So we center a lot of the early learning on some histor like historical lenses and frameworks for thinking about the past. There's things like space and place and history of violence and production and consumption of culture. So I, wanna, I want them to see those themes among others and to, to come up with their own themes that become more apparent collectively over the course of the year. And when we do that socially, like it inevitably leads to different or new kinds of learning that didn't take place um, with previous classes um, in, in years prior. So that's where I would say, I, I just simply, <laughs> it's a bit of a block for me. I don't understand the need for that closed loop when you could have the closed loop learning in other formats. For me, just, I, I don't want hypothesis to be that space. I want it to be a lot of voices coming to the forefront. That's actually really helpful for me and how I'll be able to respond to instructors that ask me that uh, in the future. Um, Justin, since you started five years ago, you must have started before we even had private groups, right? So your students were annotating publicly at that time. Uh, can you talk a little bit about actually full public annotation? And, and if, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and also the fact that I, my, by my memory, there were other courses, uh, students as part of other courses uh, using American Yelp and annotating American Yelp at that time. So I doubt that you guys are, the, you, I don't think you were the only ones there. You're, 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 yeah, you're absolutely right, Jeremy. I think the private groups came in mid-year of our first year. And I did switch to it just for like in Yop in particular, because so many people were using it. It was really you know, sort of hard to navigate and see where my students were aside from, you know, looking, lumping them into a particular group, even if it was publicly oriented. I, I will say like there are times when I intentionally have students annotate publicly to have them be a part of the conversation. And an example of that, like I'm oftentimes wanting or lamenting the fact that there aren't more um, electronic digital texts for history. And there are more coming to the forefront every day. There's a really good one in world history right now through the Open Ed Resource Project. Um, but an example of this, like I used a blog post, blog post from Waldo Jaquith talking about the impracticality of a cheeseburger, which is sort of an interesting way, like how you can't make a cheeseburger on your own. You couldn't raise the cattle, make the cheese, grow the lettuce, the tomatoes, the wheat to make the buns. And we were doing it around this concept of, you know, Colombian exchange, uh, interconnection of the world brought through what we might consider like an early modern era. And I had my students annotate publicly and then I tagged Waldo on Twitter. And wouldn't you know it, he then saw that and went into the blog post and started commenting on the students' posts and sort of pushing and prodding them as the author of this initial thing. And it was, it was just this great little moment of the connectivity that exists when you don't have that closed loop. So for me, I, you know, there are times very intentionally when I want them to annotate publicly, because also if we think about message boards or comments on websites, like having them be uh, really thoughtful and intentional digital citizens is also sort of a, a part and parcel to what I'm seeking them to get from an American studies course. So if they're annotating publicly, they're more likely to be more responsible and intentional with what they're posting and how they're posting and how they're conversing. And I think that's, I mean, it's 2020, we can see that playing out in a number of ways in students' lives. So as somebody who is very publicly facing in their own um, sort of social media presence, I think it's important for them to get that piece too. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm a student in your class, it's day one. How do you introduce hypothesis? Or if you went when, whenever the first day you introduce it, Katie, like how do you let me know, how do you introduce me to this new thing I'm gonna be doing? Assuming I wasn't in Justin's course, you know, last semester. It's a new thing to me. Yeah, so I actually when I first started using it, I pulled um some of Justin's annotations from the prior year. He had added me to their group after I got hired before I was teaching here to be able to follow along and see the work that they were doing. So I actually went in and grabbed um, some sample annotations that I thought um, were great models. One that felt like a good amount of like length and significance. Um, uh, another that was quite kind of elaborate and had connected to information that they had already covered in the class or a different section. And then a last one that um, 
did some good job like linking to other sources and things like that. So I try to grab a few um, and then I have some um, bullet points that I definitely stole from Justin at one point about like reminding them at this point, again, they're, they're juniors and Justin and I teach um, what's our advanced level at our school. So one of the higher levels of the class. So um, I try not to talk too much about like, what does it mean to annotate, but I really try to emphasize the, the quality over quantity. And um, I try to say that they're like not allowed to word, use the word interesting ever because it doesn't mean anything and it's a huge cop out. Um, so that one I try to um, avoid right from the start, but um, really show them those examples and, and show them how to reply um, and say that that counts as, counts as an annotation um, too, to continue that dialogue. and. Um, and then I try to tweak from there. I think going to your point before about I really just want to see one kid's annotations. Yeah, they're all in one group, but you can go in the hypothesis group, click on the username and see what that student has contributed to that text. So um, we just had our first ones today. So later tonight, I'll go through and just see if there's any feedback I want to give them in terms of depth or quantity or anything like that. But um, I just think exemplars in this case and reminding them what the point is to annotate. One last thing I'll say is I also try to be really transparent about how I'm going to use the annotations. And I think this is something that Justin um, alluded to earlier. I'm a big fan of scanning annotations before class. And I tend to pull out particular passages that kids really like honed in on or I will grab discussion questions right out of the questions that kids pose on there. Um, and I do that to make sure that we're on the same page about what is, what is interesting and, and um, holding their attention. But I also use it as a, a type of ownership too. So I could say, hey, Justin, last night on that reading, you asked this question. Can you tell me like why that came up for you? And can you say a little more? Does anyone have a thought about that? So I'm also then putting it on the students to bring, I, I really try to um, shape it as a pre-conversation. So I really try to like own that when I bring it to the room and carry on the conversation from there. Yeah, I, for me, having done this for five years now, like I've, I don't like to spend a ton of classroom time like walking through the logistics of how to get on and how to like create your account and what your username should be like. The, I will say this is the first year in five years where every student did it correctly, like got their account, logged into the group. So I feel good about my workflows there. I love the hypothesis um, animation on the intro that, that exists on the website you know, sitting around a campfire in the beginning. Like, I just love that as a quick little introduction. Uh, and then I, I borrowed this from Remy Kalir. I just, I have them annotate their syllabus on really the first assignment with hypothesis um, and have them think about what that means. So I give them some scaffolded instructions, like one thing you like, one thing that's unclear, and then one thing that you could change. Cause I'm trying to get them have some ownership and agency in their own learning. And the idea that they might be able to change something in a syllabus is, is oftentimes really like foreign to them. It's new. Um, and then that leads to a really interesting conversation about what their learning should look like and could be in our class for the year. Um, and we, we typically spend a lot of time in the second or third class talking about that because they've never really been asked that question before. And wouldn't you know it, like one thing you liked about the syllabus, the, the, Katie, the word that Katie alluded to, interesting. Oh, I thought this was interesting. And then we talk about what that means and really what it means to be additive in annotations. So we do, we do a lot of time early on really trying to onboard them around what a good annotation could look like. Um, so for tomorrow, they're doing Langston Hughes's poem, Let America Be America Again. And they're using, so, um, they're using some of the frameworks, some of the tags. I'm gonna go heavy into tags this year um, around like the lenses that we might consider often appearing in our class. So I'm, I'm asking them to pick out some of the experiences that we've alluded to in the first few days together, but really just a lot of like practice and, and hands-on for lack of a better word. Um, but in a way that is really meaningful to them. Can you talk more, Justin, and then I want to hear the same from Katie in terms of uh, building on this idea of lessons, right, in terms of, uh, or lenses, sorry. Um, uh, and, you know, more than just say, say something smart and additive, 
how you direct students to be structured in their, um, in their discussion of, and commentary on a text. Lenses is one way using the tags. Um, you can elaborate more on that particular, like what kind of lenses you're bringing in, but are there other uses of tags or other ways to structure the sort of annotation ex exercise that you deploy? I, you know, so often in history class, it's simply been like on this date, this thing happened or this white guy spoke and this person died. And, and we want really, particularly in an American studies class, looking at the history side of things, we want to get beyond that and look to like textual cultural lenses and just a different way. Again, the phrase I use is big tent history, um, trying to get them to think about the big picture. But there, there are certainly themes that routinely pop up regardless of the text that you're using, whether it's Yop or phone or giving you liberty, like there are trend lines in American history around narratives um, that are that are critical of the past or that are promotional of America's past. Um, I use a number of them that are that are largely informed by just sort of the American, a, a more traditional American studies approach around things like race, ethnicity and indigeneity, um, democracy, activism in class, um, space and place, production and consumption of culture, like America in the world. So all of these, like, no matter what we're looking at in, in the past, we can oftentimes find multiple layers or lenses that we might consider to be defining that experience, that event, um, those instances. But it's what, what I really like is when the students start to come up with their own collectively, when they start to find new trend lines or they start to connect the dots across time and space. I have found that those sort of tags and those lenses help them to see the bigger picture and not simply just go, okay, we are now 1491 to 1607, it's pre-contact to Jamestown and now we're done with that unit. Well, no, 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 like the history, it's gonna build upon that unit and we need to see those themes, those trends, those experiences shaping what, what comes next and what comes after. So for me, it helps with periodization and for getting them to think chronologically, but also connected across time and space as we go through the course of the year. I would agree. I think um, in dealing with older students predominantly in what I've done with Hypothesis so far, I think as I tackle it, um, this is only the second year of taught freshmen, so um, I'm reminding myself already of what that's like. Um, I'm going to have to create some more structures there, but I think eventually, like Justin said, I think they they settle into their own patterns and own connections, I think, as we reinforce that. but. Um, again, transparency is the big one for me. Um, I try to be really clear. We use Canvas as our LMS, and um, I always write not only the assignment for the next class, but also what we're doing in class the next class. So um, that give, gives them some guidance. Um, Jess and I, when we use Yop, we'll use like the page notes feature sometimes to add in guiding questions and key terms as well. Um, but my students today, we, we read for our summer reading book, um, John Lewis Gaddis's um, The Landscape of History. And we were talking about a particular section today that talked about how um, freedom is comes out of the collision between oppression and liberation. Um, and they knew that going into their reading for last night. So um, they read Nicole Hannah Jones's article for the 1619 project about black Americans and democracy. So they knew going into that, that they were looking for those themes to be um, prominent there because that was going to fuel our discussion for next class. So I think um, transparency is kind of my, my best suggestion there for folks. Thanks, Katie. And this is my last question and then I think we'll open it up uh, to uh, the chat and, and to others to, to chime in. Um, I wanna get at something you were pointing, at, uh, pointing out, Katie, about the difference between what it might look like for freshmen at St. George's to be annotating versus seniors. But I want to contextualize that by saying that the vast majority of Hypothesis users and partners are in higher ed. Um, so a large part of the audience for Liquid Margins, although we'll be sharing this with our secondary partners, obviously, um, is you know, uh, students and teachers in, in uh, colleges and universities. And I imagine seniors at St. George's are pretty college ready, right? So they would maybe be equivalent to a lot of, uh, you know, college annotation experience. Um, so can you talk about just what annotation means at high school and maybe especially in terms of like introducing it and early level to, to freshmen and why it's important then? Yeah, um, I know in the humanities department we've been working on a skills curriculum the past two years and I think um, we 
see our earlier years at St. George is about um, learning particular skills around English and history and um, the basics of how to write and how to read and how to research. And then I think we see in junior year, everyone's taking American history and American literature, um, really solidifying and, and um, honing those skills. And then in our senior year, I think the hope is to then apply them to more specialized courses like, like economics or government or something like that. And um, so for me, especially when we hit kind of that junior and senior year, annotation is to be able to um, come to this collaborative space and to create your own meaning from a text. I think um, in younger years, you're kind of given a text and the, the analysis level is kind of like factual and synthesis, like it's more definitions or um, how does this compare to this other thing we read, a little bit more straightforward. Whereas when we're getting into the older years, we're asking kids to really create meaning and analysis on their own. So um, as I begin thinking about working with it with freshmen, I think I have that lens of they're going to need more guide, like their guiding questions are, are going to need to be um, more specific. And it might be about the content, but it might also be the structure. Can you identify like, the topic sentence in this paragraph. Like it might be more basic along those skill lines or how does this compare to what we read last night? Whereas I see like Justin alluded to with the, the juniors, the hope is, and, and they actually are pretty good about doing it, is that they're doing that naturally. In their annotations, they're seeing those connections um, across, across topic and chronology and um, sometimes even class subject as well. I was psyched already on, on day one today with um, my kids were bringing in stuff from their English American studies class uh, today and they were reading Claudia Rankin's Citizen and they were talking about Black Americans and citizenship and, and what that meant. So um, we're lucky um, again to, ha to have some really strong kids that maybe mimic some of those um, college age folks, um, but I think you need to lay that groundwork and guide that identification so that they then can do that for themselves later on. Hey, I think I'm going to jump in here because we're running out of time. Um, we have a couple of questions. Thanks everyone who asked questions and um, a lot of them were answered right in the chat by other people. So that's great. Um, but uh, John Pettis wanted to know about grading. Um, and he says, how can you reduce me hating my life when it's time to do grading? What have you guys heard as rubrics for grading annotation? And do you have any features to make that less painful for teachers? Um, so if you could kind of speak to that. And I guess I'd also add on to that by asking, do those rubrics change depending on the class and how they take to annotation and what kinds of things they do. So if there's like this group think in the class, do you then adjust your grading criteria? I'll start because Justin's laughing at me um, and I know he's laughing at me. Um, I do what Justin calls um, ungrading in my class. So I'm, I'm essentially like a feedback only um, teacher. We do have broader rubrics for the class, but we sit down at the end of each marking period and kids essentially self reflect, propose a grade and we have a conversation about it. So I'm um, pretty on really on one end of the spectrum with this. Um, but I will say, I talk to a lot of teachers that are interested in de-emphasizing grades, but don't go completely um, gradeless or to the extent that I do. And I will say, and I liked, I read one of these comments um, in the chat already about making it um, part of just kind of participation, participation and engagement in general. And that's how I actually frame it in my class. I don't, I don't use the word like participation or participation grade. I use the word engagement. Um, and hypothesis is one aspect of engagement, as is verbal communication in class, as is participating in group work as is like um, taking notes in class. So I, I try to look at engagement as more holistic and 
and their annotations instead of grading them. Like I said, I'll sometimes click on a username in our hypothesis group and kind of scan their annotations as more of a collective and we'll give that student individual feedback. Hey, I had one student the sucker. Hey, hey, student one. Um, I see that your annotations are quite brief and seem to just be reiterating on what someone else has written. Can you um, next class try to work on like expanding your comment a little bit or adding another question to the end? So I think some, an, another aspect is kind of to look at the collective um, experience of that student and either grade or provide feedback on that. And I'll let Justin now these. No, I mean, I, I think uh, Katie, Katie has said it really well. For me, causation, correlation, oftentimes the students who are not, not doing the most, but are most consistently annotating tend to perform really well across all of the, the different types of assignments I might give to them in the class. So it, it's a, it's for them, it's a formative piece of assessment. And to Jeremy's point earlier and Katie's point earlier about like, oh, I have to stop and then I have to annotate. Like, yes, precisely that we want you to read closely and annotating your text requires you to read closely and with intention as opposed to just simply scanning text and having eyes on screen and then saying that you're done. When you annotate, you have to stop, think, reflect, digest, and distill that information in a way that's useful for you. So it becomes a bellwether for me to see where that student is, particularly early on. If you know if they're only doing one or two annotations a night and they're not very additive, I'm gonna, I, that gives me a chance to pull that student in and have a conversation with them about what this should be and how it could look. I typically don't want to grade annotations beyond that participation piece. Sometimes I'll give a very intentional designed annotation assignment, uh, but even still, I, you know, for me, like the formative quizzes and stuff, it's always very low stakes. It's meant to be about the learning. And I always tell them like these annotations are for you and that's, that's the collective you. That's why we're doing it socially so you can learn from one another. I will have students who will not, they just, they don't like to speak in groups. But when they get into hypothesis, they drive conversation, they drive discourse, and they'll have all of their peers jumping on to comment and engage in ways that just don't happen in the classroom. And I love that because then those students have this really powerful voice and it gives them an opportunity to demonstrate their learning and to really drive discourse and conversation so much so that that will oftentimes serve as a jumping off point for me in the next class, so. Oh, that's great. I mean, I often think of it as, um, a vehicle to let every student raise their hand. Because um, when I, in the way back days when I taught um, composition, um, there were so many students who just would like never raise their hand, literally those back of the class students. And then the students who raise their hand all the time and you wanted to, you know, say, you know, it's great, I'm glad you're raising your hand a lot, but you really want to hear from those others. And it was almost impossible to get some of them to raise their hand. So I think with collaborative annotation, there is that, you know, Maybe it's less intimidating or something. Um, but anyway, we are really out of time. And I just want to thank everybody who joined us today and also remind you that next week, um, next Friday, the 11th, um, the topic will be world languages. So it's global margins, annotating world languages. And we hope to see you all there. Um, and I would like to give our wonderful guests a chance to say goodbye and leave us with whatever wisdom or happiness they want to leave us with. I guess I'll start by um, I think not seeing hypothesis as another like tech tool. I think oftentimes with tech um, we just want especially right now during COVID it's like add the thing, add the thing, add the thing. Um, and I think that seeing hypothesis as a tool that is really low low lift if if you design it that way for the faculty and huge payoff um and it's it's not complicated uh to use or onboard or anything like that so um i think just seeing the additive um nature of hypothesis to your your students learning um is massive so i don't know if i need to convince people of that but i think the um Pay off, intellectual payoff for um, how much it takes to use um, is just wonderful, so. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I am somebody who's very tech heavy in their teaching and, and like a lot of bells and whistles and flashy and novelty, 
just as a way of engaging students where they are now. But for me in 15 years in the secondary school classroom, like this is the one tool that I could point to and go like, nope, this has made me a better and more effective teacher. And it has supported student learning in really like measurable ways. And th as a result, I'm just a, a tremendous fan of it. So um, I'm, I'm so happy to have found it five years ago. I just want to say one last thing, Karen, which is to, to thank Justin for his many years of collaboration and partnership. And it's very exciting that St. George's is moving forward with an official pilot of the Hypothesis LMS integration. Uh, there are a number of uh, independent secondary schools that have come on in the past few months as uh, you know, that model of education is moving online and needing tools like this. And um, just finally, I just want to say I think I would really like us on Liquid Margins to continue this conversation and include some other institutions and types of institutions. Uh, you know, St. George is a, one school that we're talking to, two wonderful teachers at, um, and you know, look for other secondary school conversations that might in school uh, include public schools and, and, and different contexts in, in the future on Liquid Margins. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Jeremy. We're definitely gonna do that. Um, it's been such a great discussion. Um, thank you again, everyone, and don't forget to join us next week, and um, we'll see you then. Have a great weekend.